Hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel and my name is Dr. Monu Mishra. So guys, this video is going to be about PhD from UK. Guys, for this video, I have specially invited my friend Ms. Sonia Chabra who has done her PhD from University of St. Andrews in UK. She will guide us about the application process, fellowship, fees, cost of living and lifestyle of a PhD student in UK. So I expect you will learn a lot from this video and so do watch this video till the end. And also if you are new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe the channel and press that bell icon so that you do not miss any further update from our channel. And you can also follow me on so various social media platforms. So let's get started with this video and have some information about PhD from UK. Hi Sonia, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. So how it's going there in Germany? Things are really well. So I think compared to any other country, we are one of the very first ones who already started opening everything now. So we are back in our labs. The restaurants are open and the pubs are open so things are going very well here so as you are aware that this video is going to be used for the purpose, educational purpose because a lot of people will learn how to apply for phd in uk so the first of all i would like you to introduce yourself to the audience hello everyone my name is dr sonia chapra i'm currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow in germany at max planck institute and before starting here, I did my PhD in UK at University of St. Andrews. Okay, so Sonia, the first question I have in my mind is why did you choose Scotland for your or UK for your PhD? So there are different reasons, but very few of those are, it's one of the English speaking countries abroad that makes life much easier. Secondly, um, I didn't think of uh, going to abroad in the first place, but once how things started progressing in my career, uh, UK was one of the very few places where the research in my field is top notch. So I decided to consider this. So Sonia, how did it all started the formal process? How did it all started? So first I contacted the professor directly about this position that I'm in, uh, interested in applying. And then he asked for the first stage was just providing all my documents, which were CV and references letter and my uh, motivation letter. And once I provided that, then they shortlist in people for interview and I had a Skype interview and afterwards they finalized or they gave me the offer letter and that's when the formal process started filling it through the university portal or the uh, procedure okay well, what was the documents in the application package that you submitted to the university so in addition to what i already provided uh, before the interview i was uh, supposed to provide ielts that english language test score i was supposed to provide all my uh, transcripts uh, from my bachelor's and master's and i was supposed to provide a tuberculosis test which is also one of the important thing for uk they asked for visa and for other purposes uh, so yeah that was mainly it so like uh, the formal process started with the interview and everything what do you think is the selection criteria in UK like what is the thing that matters most for your selection like it is like great that matters or experience they much matters or research paper what was actually the thing that matters most in the case of selection I think the topmost priority is really having the experience in that certain field and if you have that then of course that's an added advantage but uh, the second uh, would be your how motivated you are I think the marks are not the sole criteria for your selection, but overall your profile, how motivated you are towards research, that's what they look for in a candidate. Okay, so uh, I have one question here, like how different the UK PhD is different from US PhD? Because in the UK, like you contact the professor and then the official process started after giving not how in the us first to apply to the application portal and then it goes to the professor and then he shortlists to take 
So yes, yeah, so I think that depends from position to position. So for instance, in my case, this position was offered by the professor directly. They had the funding of their own. It has nothing to do with the university. They are the sole uh, people who can decide whom to offer that position. Whereas in US, often you have uh, some initial uh, courses, like you have to take those courses and afterwards you are allowed to pick the professor you will be doing your PhD with. In okay. those cases, the university decides or shortlists the candidates and offers a position and then later in the second stage, you get a professor or you are basically hired by the professor. So like you said, you have a direct uh, application process for, for the professor. So is there any other means like from the university that the university is offering PhD and then it takes? Uh, not in my knowledge, but I know there are certain different programs they have often. For instance, I know one of the program which is called Criticat program in our university, which is a joint program between different universities in Scotland. And over there, they first are hired uh, as a candidate for this program by the university. And once they are selected, they do a coursework for an year. And afterwards, they decide which professor they want to do their PhD with because every professor who's contributing to these programs, they will uh, just put up a position that they have or the project that they are interested in. And then the candidate can pick those projects and then they can have one-to-one -one interviews and decide who is best for which position. Okay, so they don't have any centralized uh, like admission process like in India, IIT rolls out, uh, uh, you know, admission. Not to my knowledge. Okay. I think the best criteria is just if you are interested in a position, either just contact the professor directly they might even have a position, so you should first check on their website if they are offering anything. If not, then you can contact them. They might have certain suggestions how you can join their group. Uh, so what kind of English language tests are often required? Like is it ILTS or TOEFL? Both are accepted or just ILTS is more concerned? I think most of the time they ask for IELTS in UK. I don't know if one already has TOEFL and that works as well, but in my contract, my offer letter, it was specifically mentioned about IELTS uh, that I, I, I think every university asked for different marks for IELTS as well. So I was offered this uh, position of PhD with full stipend and everything. And there was one condition that I should have at least IELTS cleared with average 6.5. Okay. So what is there any value of grades? Like often I have seen great in, in India or in US, they ask for, you know, a GP of four or 4.5 out of five. So I think on an average, it's nice to have higher grades, but I don't think it's the sole criteria. I think if you have average grades, it already puts you in a good profile instead of having someone below first division, for instance. But it doesn't matter uh, that if you have you are top of your class or let's say if you're second top, it doesn't really change much. Okay. So now coming to another important point is what about the fellowship and tuition fees? How much is the tuition fees and how much is the fellowship that you get average in UK? So that's one of the biggest, at least in my experience, the issue within uh, UK, the tuition fees is very, very high. So if you are a student uh, from Europe, then the tuition fees is 4,000 uh, pounds per year and usually PhD is for four years, three to four years at least, whereas as soon as you are an international student outside Europe, this fees is uh, even higher. So there is a difference between international uh, and uh, basically home or EU student, and that fees is about uh, £13,500. So oh. on, on total, a fees for me was £17,500 per year, and that's one of the reason why my advisor, PhD advisor, asked me in that email if I have any contact from UK or not, uh, because I'm not eligible for UK funding. I am only eligible for international funding. And for that, I would need to provide this money, which is the balance, oh. 13,500, which I had no access to, let's put it like that. So it's um, <laughs> In the end, everything worked out. 
Uh, I did get all this fellowship, so everything worked fine. I didn't have to put anything from my pocket. Um, and the stipend they offered me for this position was uh, 3.5 years. Every year I was getting about 13,000 pounds, which uh, comes about 1,200 pounds every month. So you get uh, around 1,200 pounds per month. Mm -hmm. And it was exclusive of your tuition fees because your tuition fees was, you know, compensated in some other way. Right. Okay, yeah. so. so there are two different things we are supposed to, we should ask for when we are getting a position. One is the tuition fees if they, that's covered. And then the second thing is the stipend. And that's our cost of living. Now, so another question I have is what is the average PhD duration in UK? So it's usually three to four years. So maximum is four years, unless there is some cases where somebody is sick, then they have to take a uh, leave of absence. But most of the cases is four years. Four years. And what is the cost of living in a uh, average, like every city in UK? It varies from city to city. So uh, the place where I was doing my PhD is uh, St. Andrews, which is same as London. So it's about 800 to 900 pounds if you are living standard life with, let's say, going out, eating every other day, having enough drinks and stuff. But yeah, I think it's a good amount of money. If you are not spending too much, then you can easily live and save. Yeah. So basically, whatever you are getting from fellowship, you can live a comfortable life there. Yeah. Okay. So... Another question is, there are two, actually it is a two cost, two stage question. What do you feel is the difference between Indian PhD, because you had done some experience of uh, research in India as well. So what is the difference between Indian research scenarios and UK research scenarios? And also what is the difference in the lifestyle? That's the most different thing, I guess. Um, so in India, often we are supposed to work longer Yes. And uh, we are expected um, not only just work longer, but uh, often we don't have enough resources. So that also limit us. Whereas in Europe or in particular in UK, uh, the ratio from uh, resources to the student is quite high. So we have enough resources and we can actually learn on our own. And the work life balance is really good. Often we are supposed to just finish our work. We don't have to stay longer, even not enough hours sometimes. So my PhD advisor, first thing he told me when I arrived in UK, that I don't care if you are at beach or if you are in the lab, I just want work to be done. Okay. So it's your time, you manage. Okay, and what is the difference in the lifestyle? Uh, I think it's really nice because you work during your working hours or you finish your stuff, there are days when you are working longer, there are other days when you don't have to, weekends are usually free. If you want, you can go and do experiments over the weekend as well, but often you are not forced to do that. So you can really enjoy your life during the weekend and go around travel. Okay, so another question is about racism and discrimination because have you ever faced like any kind of racism or discrimination in UK? No, I think it's very, very international, especially the university campus. It's so international that people are from all over the world and you actually feel like being home. So that's good. Inside, besides, I have also heard like there are too many Indians in UK, so it feels like a mini India sometimes. It depends on the place. So in London, yes. Uh, in Scotland, not really. So uh, would you like to give any suggestions to the students who are willing to apply in UK? What kind of suggestions would you like to offer? So there are a few things. One would be um, one should really think about where they want to do their PhD and what are their future goal. Because often we think of, OK, that's something for now we want to do, but we don't know what the future holds. And often we are still restricted after the PhD what are the other opportunities? And if you don't feel like staying alone, uh, and if you are really into having lots of food, a lot of nice Indian food, it gets very difficult living abroad. So do consider all those things in mind. Okay, so anything how to prepare their application or... Uh, I think they are already, 
already you have covered all these things in your other lecture series. So I, I assume they all know by now. So like, is there any difference in like the approach approach in UK or somewhere else? Because in the US um, it's different and in the UK it's entirely different. Yeah, I think uh, in my experience, US and India is very similar. Often you are supposed, you are treated like a student. You are always doing everything by asking your uh, advisor. Whereas in UK or within Europe, at least it's very similar. You are treated as a researcher. And often your boss asks you what is the best thing to do it because they think you know better than anyone else. You are the one working on this, which is really good. You are treated like an individual. And this is something if you think you are an independent researcher, you can take a lead. You can do your stuff on your own. I think this is the best place for you. That's good. That's good. So I think people have learned a lot from this video and I would like to thank you for your time. And I really appreciate that you, you know, give some time for this video and people will learn for a lot from this one. So thank you very much. And if there will be any other question, I'll come to you for clarification. And if not, let's see <laughs> things yeah. happen. So thank you very much for this time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So guys, I think you would have received a lot of information and knowledge from this video. Sonia has explained everything that you need to know and if you still have any further questions or queries, do put it in the comment section. I'll try to get to you as soon as possible and also you can support me by sharing this video and subscribing to the channel and all your questions can be uh, answered in the meanwhile. So stay connected. I will come with even more interesting and informative video in the next part. So till then, stay connected, subscribe the channel, share the video and also keep watching my video. Thank you very much. We'll meet in the next video. Thank you.